Thank you, Donny, for that wonderful prayer. Happy Father's Day. I know there are many fathers who are uh, showing up and bringing it every single day of the week. They are loving and caring. They are, they are teaching and sacrificing and blessing their families and blessing their children. And I want to thank God for you men. No, uh, fathers, I have a special word for you. Well, not me. It's not my word. Uh, it's God's word. This word could be for everybody, uh, but I think it's for you. Uh, this week, uh, I was reading Isaiah 48, verse 6, and, and God just sort of impressed that upon my heart. Uh, kind of like, Sean, this is what I'm doing, right? This is what I'm doing. So I want to give that word to you. This is it, Isaiah 48, verse 6. You have heard, now see all this, and will you not declare it? From this time forth, I announce to you new things, hidden things that you have not known. God is doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing in the world, and he's doing a new thing in your heart. He's doing a new thing in your life. He's doing a new thing in our time. And I want you to receive that word. This is the season of a new thing. Now, I also want to say uh, a big thank you to all of those who came and made yesterday such a blast. To all our volunteers, to the planners, to those who raised money for this to become a reality, to Island Bagging and our brother Stanley Bassett, to Meridian Trust. Thank you so much. Because of your combined efforts, we were able to give out hundreds and hundreds of bags of food to those who needed it most. You guys are rock stars. And I thank God uh, for doing such a great thing in your life. Uh, what a blessing it was to see what we saw yesterday. Okay, so my name is Kenyatta, and if this is your first time viewing our service, I am one of the pastors here at Harvest Bible Chapel. Today we are in Acts chapter 21 from verse 27, so why don't you go and get your Bibles out, go to Acts chapter 21, verse 27. We are picking up from where we left off last week, where we talked about the fact that uh, what to do when the road ahead is bumpy. Uh, we are continuing in our series, uh, Unstoppable God, Church on Mission. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us right now. Uh, Father, I praise you for being great and kind to us. We do not deserve your goodness, and yet you show it to us over and over in big and little ways. Without fail, you are good. Thank you so much for that. I pray that you would bless those uh, who are fathers, that they may reflect your fatherhood to everyone. And I pray that you bless all those who gave and planned and worked to help others in need uh, yesterday. Please provide for them. Uh, please bless their families and, and, and increase their storehouses, so to speak. And Father, bless them with an ever-increasing knowledge of you and of your love for them. And as we hear from you today, uh, bless us with open hearts and minds to behold the wonders of your word and to experience the power of your Holy Spirit. Raise us up to new life in you. Fill us with hope and wisdom and love. Grant us peace and clarity for these times. Guide our steps into paths of righteousness and justice and generosity and salvation. We love you, Father. Help us to love you. Help us to love our brothers and sisters even more than ever. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, uh, the Word of God told us that uh, when the road ahead is bumpy, when hardships, when suffering, and when pain is ahead of us, that we should seek out others, we should stay the course, we should share God at work stories, and we should submit to wise advice. Now, I hope you are keeping those things in mind, and I hope that you are choosing to do them now rather than later, because if you do... When you are actually on that road, 
when suffering and pain and tough times are not a distant thought in the future, but a present reality, then you would be ready to do this. And I want you to write this down. Go ahead and do that now. Write this down, please. Trust God because he is with you. Trust God because he is with you. Now, look at the text. Acts 21 uh, 27, and uh, follow along as I read. When the seven days were almost completed, uh, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stood up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone, everywhere, against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him in, out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort uh, that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! Away with him! Now, Paul's situation has gone from bad to worse. Here he is, falsely accused by this hysterical, angry mob. He's then beaten within an inch of his life, and then he's arrested without a chance to state his case. Now, maybe you've been there before, falsely accused for something you did not do, attacked by bitter people who blame everyone and everything else but themselves for the plight that they're in. And when you thought the system would help, it failed you. So what do you do? You trust God because he's near you. God is closer than those who are coming against you. And he's even closer than the fires of hardship and suffering. Now look at what Psalm 23 verse 4 says. And many of us know Psalm 23. Some of us have uh, memorized that psalm by now. But look at what verse 4 says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now notice the context of this line. The writer is still in the valley of pain. God had not yet removed the hardship. God had not removed the suffering. But what is of most importance to him is not escape from pain, but the presence of God in the moment, in that season, or that age of pain. He is rejoicing because God is with him. Now let me ask you a question. What's your favorite food? Think about it. What's your favorite food? Okay, you have it? All right. What made that food your favorite? Now, here's what I have learned about why people eat what they eat. It's all about taste. The number one reason that people eat what they eat is because it tastes good. Now, we may develop a palate for other types of food later on, but deep down, it boils down to one thing, taste. And because of taste, that's why I love potatoes. Listen, I love potatoes. I love it by itself. I love it in a pie. I love it when you mash it. 
I love it when you fry it. I love it when you roast it. I love it when you bake it. I, I'm sure by now you're getting the picture, right? I love potatoes. Now, here's the thing. I don't love potatoes because of its nutritional value or content. I love it because it tastes good. And probably because when I was young, I ate a lot of it. Now, speaking of which, I remember thinking when I was much younger, and I remember thinking this, boy, I can't wait to get older. I can't wait to get my own money so that I can buy as much potatoes as I wanted. Because for me, um, happiness when I was young uh, was mashed potatoes and corned beef, and I love that. No, as much as I like potatoes, you know what I've never thought about? I've never thought about how long it takes for my stomach to digest potato. No, hands up, if, if you choose your food on the length of time it takes to digest. I'm sure not many of us raised our hands, right? Uh, but get this, did you know that potato alone takes about 60 minutes to digest in the stomach. That's a little bit of trivia there for you. However, if you add um, beef and cheese with that, get this, it can take up to four hours to digest. Now, uh, why is it that the time a food takes to digest in a stomach does not determine whether we eat it or not? You know why? Because taste rules. Nobody is sitting down, wow, um, this is going to take two hours and 45 minutes to digest, so I'm not going to eat this. No, nobody is doing that. We eat food because it tastes good. But guess what? We do the same with biblical truths. We spiritually digest the truths of God we find most appealing because it tastes good. So we love to talk about God's love, and that's good because God is love, and God does love us. But guess what? The truths that we don't find as appealing, such as God's judgment against sin or God's wrath, guess what we do? We dismiss it. We don't even spend time thinking about it. Now, depending on what your spiritual digestion system looks like, what I am going to say to you will either take a long time or a short time to spiritually digest. So get ready, right? Get ready. Listen to this. Trusting God is not primarily about your deliverance or escape from hardship. It's about God's presence with you, according to what Psalm 23 verse 4 says. Uh, the object of trusting God is his presence. In other words, we trust God to be near to us when we are going through hardships, when we are going through difficulties, rather than deliver us or delivering us from hardships. So when everyone is against you, when the system fails you, when your friends desert you, when the valley is deep and wide and there seems to be no end to the bumpy road, trust God that he would never leave your side. He would never leave your side. No, Psalm chapter 16 verse 11 says this. You make known to me the path of life. Watch this. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And then Psalm 34 verse 18 reminds us that no matter how hard the season, no matter how hot the fire or how painful the experience is, God is close. And get this. It's in those moments when times are the toughest that God is closer to us than before. But here's the thing to keep in mind. 
the very reality of God's presence brings with it salvation, deliverance, peace, comfort, endurance, growth, clarity, joy. It brings all of these things. So if we limit our trusting of God to deliverance only, we miss out on all the other things that God brings. But get this, God has decided in his infinite wisdom that his presence, his nearness to us, to you, to me, is more important than the ending of your tough season. I'll say that one more time. I'll say that one more time. Because it's important for us to get this, and I want us to digest this. God has decided in his wisdom that his presence, being near to us, being with us, is more important to us, more important to you, and more important to me, than the ending of your tough season. So trust in God that he is near, and then trust in him that he is near to you. That's how we do it. We trust that God is near. Does that mean you cannot pray for deliverance? Does that mean you should not pray for healing if you are sick? Does that mean that you should not pray that God uh, would give you justice? No. It doesn't mean that. But this is what I'm saying, right? And I want to repeat it. This is what I'm saying. If we only trust God or we only see God as deliverer, but we don't see him as comforter, but we don't see him as joy giver, but we don't see him as the one who brings clarity, but we don't see him as the one who gives us creative ideas about the future. We are going to limit him, and we are going to limit the ability to receive from him all that he has. So what I'm saying, trust God that he is near. Trust in him that his presence, because it is in his presence and with him being near that you get everything. If you only limit your trusting of God to deliverance, you're going to miss out on so much more. So do this. Trust God that no matter what you are currently experiencing or would experience in the future, he would complete the work that he has started in you. He would do the works that he has planned for you to do. And it may be that he may bring deliverance from a trial, but it may mean that he will uh, give you endurance through that trial before deliverance. But trust him that because he is near, he's going to do what he says he will do. And in his timing, it may be deliverance, but it may be joy, and it may be endurance. Now, listen to these words from three young men who stood up against a tyrant. And this story is found in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. I'm going to read it for you. Daniel 3, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. He was about to throw them into a, a, a burning pit, Okay? Look at what they say. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Listen to that. He is able to deliver. We trust that he would bring deliverance. We want deliverance. His ability to deliver is not in question. But look at how the text goes on. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So these guys, these teenagers, are trusting God to be a deliverer. But it goes on, verse 18. But if not, you get that? 
if God doesn't deliver us, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Get that? Let me speak from the heart here. A lot of us, when God doesn't come true for us, when he doesn't heal our loved one, or the loved one dies, or he doesn't take away the pain, or the marriage that we have been praying about ends, or the job that we have been praying for, we lose that job, we get fired. You know what some of us do? God, I'm done with you. I trusted you to deliver me, and you did not come true. So I'm done with you. Look at what these guys did. Teenagers. Look at what they did. They told the king, listen, God could deliver us if he wants. He could deliver us if he wants. But if he chooses not to, we'll still love him. We'll still trust him. And we will not stop believing in his power. We will not stop believing in him because we know who he is. And I want to say this to you. Maybe God has not yet delivered you out of your situation. Maybe God has not delivered you or healed you from that thing that you have been praying about. But I want you to know this. God is with you in the fire. He's with you in the storm. He's with you when you cry at night. He's with you and he hears you when you cry out to him, when you think no one is listening. God, how long? How long must I endure this? I want to encourage you. Trust his presence because he is with you. And his presence is more important and more necessary to us than his deliverance. God will never leave you and he will never forsake you. So trust him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It has blessed my heart in preparing it and in even saying it right now. It has blessed my heart. Would you, Father, take this word and would you breathe life into it? And would you breathe life upon it? And would you scatter this word to the four corners of this world and bring knowledge and hope and trust and wisdom and insight and blessing to all those who are going to hear it? In Jesus' name, amen.